A few months back, I purchased the highest mileage motorcycle I could find on Craigslist. I was interested in knowing just how bad a high mileage motorcycle would actually be after being encouraged or perhaps discouraged to purchase such a beast by Canadian motorcycle celebrity Ryan F9. Built to go fast, not to last. You want a cheap old Toyota? That'll work. But a motorcycle with six figures on the clock? We'll be absolutely shocked. Absolutely shocked. In my previous documentary, I went through the good and not so bad of owning a motorcycle with 200,000 kilometers. Surprisingly, the BMW K259 engine ran and tested well when checked with the compression tester and a cylinder leak down test. The bike being 24 years old does need some TLC on the brakes and the originally equipped clutch, which is dangerously on its last leg. Note here I said leg and not legs. It's actually more like a stump. The clutch is beyond trustworthy at this point, but remember this is, to my belief, the original clutch the bike left Germany with. Not satisfied yet, I have one more test to run before spending a dime on fixing the BMW. So today on Rod Rides and Wrenches, we get to the final test before spending any money on the R1100 RT or pawn it off to some other schmuck. Forget about it. Ready to waste their money on a high mileage motorcycle. <laughs> So if you remember back to the last video on the BMW R1100RT, when we looked at the bike, other than a few issues with the ABS system and some general maintenance, the bike checked out fairly well. The compression test showed solid results in both cylinders and the leak down test confirmed the bike's valves, pistons, cylinders and rings were in very good operational condition. Not satisfied, I contacted Mark Rodin of OilDepot.ca, which is an Amzol oil dealer. Mark also works with a company called Oil Analyzers Inc., who test oil for contamination from other fluids and engine particles, analyzing those particles to give you a clue as to potential parts failures. Primarily working with heavy oil, forestry, and mining equipment with laboratories in Edmonton, Alberta, I thought it would be interesting. These labs work with equipment fleets to maximize oil drain intervals while extending equipment life and reducing problems that would require the machines to be shut down. Because in most of these applications, equipment like this is operating 24 seven. So let's have the oil from the BMW analyzed. But first we need a baseline, another sample from a completely different bike, one that would not only be years newer, but at 23,000 miles or roughly 41,000 kilometers, a quarter of the distance ridden when compared to the BMW. If you are already a subscriber to Rod Rides and Wrenches, then you probably know I recently finished up the repairs and modifications on a 2004 Honda ST1300. Luckily, this bike was on the hoist and in need of an oil change, so this bike was the one chosen to be our baseline guinea pig. This would be your standard oil and filter change done on a hot engine. I would catch the oil in the supplied sample containers which have their own unique tracking information. This ensures we don't mix up our samples. With the Honda oil change done and sample labeled, it was the BMW's turn. So again, I warmed up the BMW and took the oil sample straight from the draining oil plug. Not being one of those guys on YouTube that likes to taste every fluid emanating from their vehicles, I'll just label the sample and send it off to the lab since dirty oil looks the same to me regardless of where it comes from. I'm also pretty sure it tastes the same too, but I'm not going to check that one out for myself. I'm pretty sure only a trained professional should ingest motor oil. Before we get to the results, I want to make sure that you're aware of a little contest that we're having on Rod Rides and Wrenches, and give you a chance to pick up $100 Canadian in parts from your favorite online parts store. Over the past few weeks, I picked up another little motorcycle project, one that several viewers have been clamoring about, and certainly one of the most popular bikes around, well at least on my channel anyways. I'm in the process of getting it ready to ride since it did need a few small fixes and then we'll run it through its paces on an upcoming video and maybe compare it to another bike or two. If you figured out what bike this is from the pictures you've just seen, put your answer in the comments below. I need the make, model and approximate year. I'll take the correct answers and draw for the $100 gift card from Fortnite if you live in Canada, Revzilla if the winner is in the United States, and Fowler Spares if you reside in UK or Europe. 
Now, for those of you outside Canada, it's still a hundred dollars Canadian dollar equivalent. Since I'm paying for this out of my own pocket, and you know, I'm still not YouTube monetized. So to double your chances of winning, make sure you've subscribed to Rod Rides and Wrenches. All right, so back to the data provided by oil analyzers. We'll start with the Honda ST1300 and talk about what the lab found there. Now, since this was the first oil change I've done on the bike since I purchased it, I didn't know the manufacturer of the oil that was in the bike or the actual weight and grade of the oil, so I didn't submit this information to the lab. I was far less interested in how much the oils of viscosity had broken down and much more interested in the contaminants that they found. The oil analyzer's report breaks findings down into four distinct oil contaminant groups. Wear metals, contaminant metals, multi-source metals, and additive metals. All these groups have specific elements or alloys that are measured in parts per million samplings. As an additional exercise, I'm going to try and determine the most likely cause for these materials and why they're showing up in our oil. Now the levels of contamination and wear debris in our oil sample depend on too many factors to sort through from machine to machine. But for simplicity and as a generalization, the oil analysis industry uses this table as a guideline. Zero to 50 parts per million is okay. 50 to 100 indicates a problem and over 100 parts per million is serious. Now this generalization runs the risk of saying that 49 parts per million of whatever contaminant is acceptable and 51 is not. In this case there is only a difference of 4% so we have to take the information provided with a grain of sodium. I want to initially point out that both the Honda and the BMW's general state of condition from the oil analysis was a level 1 or what's considered normal. This is a general scale from 0 to 4 provided by the analysis report and is a high level look at the engine oil and what's found in it. After this general grade, more specifics are laid out of what is actually found in the oil. The Honda did show signs of slight fuel contamination to the oil. This fuel contamination can be the result of fuel leaking down past the piston rings when the motor is started up and then shut off abruptly and unburned fuel remains in the cylinder or intake plenum. That's why it's always important to let your motor warm up. The first wear metal to be found on the Honda ST1300's oil was iron at 7 parts per million. Iron mostly comes from cylinder linings, rings, camshafts, crankshafts, rods, valve train, oil pump gears, wrist pins, and other gears that you'll find inside the motor. Iron appears as fine particles in the engine oil due to abrasion or wear on these components. Again, at seven parts per million, this is normal engine wear and a byproduct of engine operation. The next wear metal was aluminum at three parts per million. This should be straightforward as it generally comes from aluminum castings, but can also be the result of wear to pistons, main and rod bearings, pumps, thrust bearings, and washers. The final wear metal found in the Honda ST's oil was copper at nine parts per million. On a motorcycle, this soft metal is present in oil cooler cores, clutch plates, brass and bronze bushings, and roller bearing outer cages. If copper is found along with high amounts of potassium and sodium, there is probably glycol in the engine oil and should be due to a water pump leak or coolant contamination of some sort. If copper is found along with lead and tin, then it's coming from a bearing or bushing inside the engine. This concluded the Honda ST1300's wear metal findings. Very low amounts of general metals you would expect to find in a low hour internal combustion engine. The next section deals in contaminant metals. These are metals that come from dirt or assembly lubes and sealants used in sealing certain parts of the engine together. Silicone in your engine comes from sealers like RTV, which stands for Room Temperature Vulcanizing Silicone, and is the most likely culprit in our engine at seven parts per million. Sodium is also present at 32 parts per million. If sodium is found in combination with potassium, which our oil sample had none of, this could also indicate coolant is getting into the oil. Sodium can also get into the engine through the air or condensation in the oil and filter. Some of this contamination could have occurred in the manufacturing and storage of engine oil and filters, 
before it even was ever put into the bite. Sodium is one of the 10 most common elements found on Earth. But in this case, the sodium we found is most likely a derivative of oil detergents. Detergents and disbursements play a key role in keeping things like dirt and carbon in suspension in your oil. Common metals that can be used to make neutral or basic detergents are sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and barium. Calcium and magnesium are the most common additives found in oil due to their low cost. Multi-source metals found in the Honda were molybdenum at 33 parts per million and boron at 19 parts per million. Molybdenum is a friction modifier added to engine oil to assist with lubrication, as is boron, which can reduce friction coefficients of metals in contact with each other. Molybdenum is also used on expensive alloys. Again, it's a way to reduce friction and extend the life of the engine components and improve performance. This leaves the additive metals section, which has some wild readings from 29 to 2322 parts per million. These elements are magnesium and calcium, which are used in oil detergents, while phosphorus and zinc are there to reduce the engine component wear since they work together to create a protective film over the engine parts and reduce metal-to-metal -metal contact inside your engine. Wear metals found in the oil of the 200,000 kilometer BMW, in addition to iron, which we've already covered, was nickel at two parts per million. Nickel is one of the hardest metals you'll find in an engine, and this metal typically comes from anti-friction bearings or the valve train. In addition to copper, there were also trace amounts of lead and tin that come from engine components like bearings and bushings. So in analyzing the oil from the BMW, there was a small amount of nickel and the oil analyzer report suggests this is at a minor level and to keep an eye on this contamination as it could be an indication of failing valve train components. Camshaft lobes are hardened with nickel chromium, valve guides and cylinder valves are also forged with nickel, so it could be that the two parts per million of nickel found in the BMW's oil is a sign of age and wear. But what do you think? Should I be concerned and not spend a few thousand dollars getting this BMW back to perfection? Tell me in the comments below if I should continue to fix the BMW or punt it down the road. I'm leaning towards fixing it up. In 2022, this bike is 25 years old and its original condition would qualify it for a collector's plate here in British Columbia. This means it would cost a few hundred dollars a year to insure and you get this cool collector license plate. So don't forget to weigh in and tell me what you think. And until our next video, be sure to enjoy the rest of the summer and ride safe.